Hello everyone. Hope the exam preparations are going good. Today we are going to solve a past exam question to see how exactly we should approach the questions in the exam. So without wasting time, I just share my screen. Yeah, so this is the December 2021 paper, which is the latest one for this particular uh, attempt. All right, I have marked the correct answers as per the uh, guideline answers given by ICAI. Let's start with the first one. GST is one of the biggest taxation reforms of independent India being implemented with the aim of enhancing the overall growth of the nation. Okay, no doubt about that. It is a comprehensive dash indirect tax levy on goods as well as services at the dash. Options are supply-based indirect tax at the national level, movement-based indirect tax at the state level, destination-based indirect tax at the national level or value-based indirect tax at the state level. Answer is destination-based and at the national level because of two reasons. First is there are two types of indirect tax, destination-based and what is the other one? Origin-based. GST is a destination-based tax and that is a phenomenal change compared to the previous tax regimes, correct? Why? Because in the previous laws, the state from where the sale was happening, that state used to get the tax revenue. That method was called origin-based taxation. Coming to GST, we have shifted to destination-based taxation where the state where the buyer is located where the consumption is happening, that state gets the tax revenue. So the answer is destination-based uh, indirect tax. And why is it at national level? Because now we have the same law operating throughout the country. That's why it is not at state level, it is at national level. Number 52, India has adopted a dual model of GST where tax is charged concurrently by the center and the states. Therefore, for an intrastate sale, the GST as per CGST Act is charged equally as SGST. This I think everybody will know. When the sale is, when the supply is intrastate, we charge CGST and SGST. When it is interstate, we charge IGST. So all of the other options are not correct. CGST and SGST is right. So that was one mark straight away in the pocket. The uniform policy recommended by the GST Council on EVA bill being to be implemented all over the country be totally eliminating the check post system. Absolutely right. Earlier there were check posts which used to create delays between transportation of goods. So to bring EVA bill into the system, the objective was to eliminate these check posts, breaking the entry barriers, which is almost the same as the first point, increasing the bottlenecks in transportation system. That is not the correct answer. We don't want to create problems by introducing EVA bills. We want to reduce the problem. So bottlenecks means what? Bottlenecks means those areas because of which we will spend more time. So it is not a bottleneck. So the answer is both A and B. So option number D. Next one. A supply made by a taxable person to a recipient consisting of two or more taxable supplies of goods or services or both or any combination thereof okay, which are naturally bundled, which are naturally bundled and supplied in conjunction with each other in the ordinary course of business. 
out of which one is the principal supply so they have given us the entire definition of composite supply all the necessary ingredients for a composite supply are there naturally bundled the first ingredient it is in the ordinary course of business second ingredient one of them is the principal supply third ingredient all of the ingredients are there this is basically the definition of composite supply itself so the answer is b composite supply next one ashoka enterprises appoints babulal to procure certain goods for them okay so ashoka is asking babulal babulal please go to the market and buy me my goods babulal identifies various suppliers who can provide such goods okay and asks chetna enterprises so chetna enterprises is going to supply to babulal babulal is going to supply to ashoka all right okay to send the goods and issue the invoice directly to ashoka enterprises so babulal is telling chetna look chetna you don't bill to me and i will then bill to ashoka i don't want that to happen you please raise the invoice directly in the name of ashoka right so in terms of the circular issued by the government what will babulal be called that is the question what is the treatment of babulal as a agent will he be called a middleman a procurement agent a pure agent or broker if you see middleman procurement agent and broker they mean almost the same pure agent is something totally different right pure agent is coming from the valuation chapter pure agent is something totally different so a b and d these were the possible answers but why procurement agent has been selected as the right answer is because in the icsi material in the icsi material there is an example based on this particular circular where they have called such cases as procurement agents that's why point number b is the right answer this is coming from the icsi study material okay next one various taxes levied under different acts were subsumed under gst on the objective of one nation one tax however certain items still continue to be taxed both under the central excise law and gst law okay so they are asking us that there are some items which suffer both central excise and gst find out such items motor spirit and natural gas alcoholic liquor for human consumption tobacco and tobacco products all of the above motor spirits natural gas is one of the five petroleum products these five petroleum products are totally outside gst so point number a cannot be our answer alcoholic liquor for human consumption is also totally outside gst am i right alcoholic liquor for human consumption is totally outside gst on point number a and b today two taxes apply first is excise duty central excise and state excise in case of a and b and the second is vat or cst if it is a local sale there will be vat if it is a interstate sale there will be cst but there is no gst on a and b whereas tobacco and tobacco products suffers central excise which is one of the taxes of old regime it still suffers central excise along with central excise it also suffers gst tobacco and tobacco products is that's why the right answer similar to tobacco and tobacco products we have one more item which suffers excise duty and gst what is that it is hemp and other narcotic drugs the difference between tobacco and narcotic drugs is tobacco suffers central excise and gst narcotic drugs they suffer state excise and gst all right in the question they had asked us for central excise and gst that's why tobacco and tobacco products is the right answer next one under model of gst adopted by india 
taxes paid on the invert supplies made by a registered person is available as input tax credit, which can be utilized for making payments under section 49. ITC of CGST can be utilized for what? Okay, so they are basically asking, ITC of CGST can be utilized for what? ITC of CGST can be first used for CGST itself and then for IGST. So let us revise what is the uh, law regarding this. If it is a IGST input tax credit, if it is IGST input tax credit, that we can use first to pay IGST. Always the first type of tax is given the preference. IGST will first get used for IGST, CGST first for CGST, SGST first for SGST. After using it for the same category of output, if some input is still left, so IGST input, first I used for IGST output, but still some IGST input is left, then that IGST input, I am free to distribute between C and S in whatever ratio I want. In whatever ratio I want, I am free to do it. Whereas coming to CGST, First, we are supposed to use against CGST output and still if there is some CGST input left that we are supposed to use against IGST only. CGST cannot use for SGST, SGST cannot be used for CGST. So in this, the correct option was option number D. Next, as per the provisions of CGST Act 2017, Supply comprises of two or more individual supplies of goods and services deliberately bundled, not naturally bundled, deliberately bundled by a taxable person for a single price that attracts the highest rate of tax is called what? It is called mixed supply. This is basically, again, the definition of mixed supply itself, which has been given. Had it been naturally bundled, had there been a principal supply, had it been in the ordinary course of business, then the answer would have been composite supply, but that is not the case. Next one. A registered person can opt under composition levy only in respect of one out of two or more business verticals having same pen. Is that true? Answer is absolutely no, it is not true because one of the conditions for going for composition scheme itself is that all of your registrations which have the same pan, every one has to opt for composition together. And if you have to come out of composition, everybody has to come out together. It is not possible for a person to say that one of my branches is under composition, the other branch is under regular scheme. It is not allowed. All of my branches, which, whichever is registered, everybody has to go for composition together. So here they were saying that uh, one business vertical will opt for it, other business vertical will not opt for it, that is not allowed. Okay, Schedule 2 of the CGST Act lists various transactions which are to be treated as supply of goods or supply of services. So what is there in Schedule 2? Schedule 2, we have list of transactions which are classified between goods and services, depending upon the transaction. Find out, uh, find and state which out of the following activities is a supply of services. We have to find out which one is a service. First one, transfer of rights in goods or undivided share in goods without transfer of title. They are saying you are letting somebody use your goods, but you are not changing the ownership. Ownership is still with you, but still you are giving the goods to somebody else. So this is a service. Had it been change of ownership, I was the owner till today, from tomorrow you are the owner. Then we would have told it is a supply of goods, but that is not the case. They are allowing the person, the owner is still continuing to be the owner, but still he is letting somebody else use the goods. That is a uh, supply of service. 
transfer in title of goods, transfer in title of goods under an agreement for a future date where transfer happens or permanent transfer and disposal of goods. All the other options are uh, supply of goods, but not supply of services. One sec. Next question. Section 10 of the CGST Act contains the provisions regarding composition levy. Okay. Section 10 2A, which is now newly introduced for the purpose, purpose of services, has enhanced the scope of composition levy primarily for small service providers. Find from the following who cannot opt for composition levy despite the enhanced enhancement of its scope. So, first one is supplier of services as salon artist. For a salon artist, there is absolutely no uh, debarment. Salon artist is covered in the 10 to a list. There is no specific entry saying salon artists are not allowed for, to go for it. Okay. Supplier of goods which are not leviable to tax. This is not allowed. Oh, this has been specifically mentioned that if you want to go for composition, you cannot supply those items on which there is no tax. Manufacture of furniture, absolutely no problem allowed. There is no specific item relating to manufacture of furniture. Manufacture of ice cream is not allowed. Casual taxable person is also not allowed. So our answer will be two, four, and five. This is not allowed. Ice cream is not allowed. And casual taxable person is also not allowed to go for it. So answer is number B, two, four, and five. Next one. Services provided to an educational institution, not by, to an educational institution, are being notified as exempt from levy of tax under GST. Okay. Find from the following services provided to an educational institution by different service providers which are exempt from the levy of tax. So this is actually out of the syllabus because the ICSI study material, it does not include exemptions in details. Okay. All right. Let us see the answer anyways. Uh, security services, cleaning or housekeeping services, transportation of students, faculty and staff. Let me share with you the list of the exemption. So this is the exemption which is being talked about. All right. So the entire exemption uh, related to education is given in uh, serial number 66 of notification number 12 bar 2017. Okay. It says there are some services if they are provided by the educational institution, then it will be exempt. What are they? Services to students, faculty or staff or conduct of entrance exam against entrance fee. These two services, if they are provided by the educational institution, it will be exempt. Then there are some services which if they're provided to the educational institution, they are also exempt. What are they? Transportation, catering, security, or cleaning and housekeeping. All right. So these three, what is common about them? They will be exempt if they're provided to an educational institution which provides education up to preschool or higher secondary. That means up to class 12. If the uh, education is being provided, then these three services will be exempt. Transportation, catering, clean, uh, security, cleaning and housekeeping. Admission or conduct of exam, if there is a service provider which is helping out an educational, with, uh, educational institution with these two activities, then it is always exempt. And supply of online journals, or online educational materials, periodicals, if that is being provided, it is exempt if the school is up to uh, providing education up to class 12, or if it is also an approved voca uh, vocational educational course. 
what is an approved vocational educational course this has also been defined where some of the government institutions have been identified so those government institutions will be covered under this particular point so they have asked question from uh, exemption chapter which is covered at the final level and in the options they have given us transportation they have given us catering and they have also given us security and cleaning so the answer was all of the above so they have given security cleaning housekeeping and transportation of students so answer was all of the above number 63 import of services under the provisions of gst is to be treated as dash and would be subject to tax which is to be charged under dash answer is interstate supply and igst has to be charged on reverse charge basis let me take you to the slide where we had done this this is covered in the definition of interstate supplies in the interstate supplies it specifically says that both in case of goods and services if there is import it is to be treated as interstate if it is import either of services or of goods before they cross the customs frontiers it has to be treated as interstate if it is interstate then what tax will apply cgst sgst will not apply igst will apply so the answer was interstate and igst on reverse charge was added in point number c in point number a on reverse charge was not there so that is crucial that's why it has to be point number c why reverse charge because we are paying the tax as a buyer when we are importing something who are we we are the buyers or we are the sellers we are the buyers whenever we have to pay tax as a buyer directly to the government then we are paying it under reverse charge itself that's why point number c is a better option compared to point number a jcc professional services is a firm constituted of company secretaries having office at jaipur okay so we are located in jaipur has been engaged by pqr international limited mumbai okay so mumbai is approaching us and asking for providing training training to its employees working in nagpur office okay place of supply in this case shall be dash and tax would be charged by jcc professional services under tax so here the first thing that we have to notice is that they are talking about training services there is something special about training services what is special about training generally wherever the training is being provided that is the place of supply generally wherever training is being provided that is the place of supply but if the customer is registered if the customer is registered if our client is registered then we will ignore where the service is being provided and we will take into consideration where is our customer where is our client registered okay now here they have given assuming that the client is not registered if the client is not registered then wherever the training service is being provided that is the place of supply so in this case where is the training being provided training is being provided in nagpur we are in jaipur customer is in mumbai but they are saying training has to be provided in nagpur so our place of supply is in this case nagpur answer will be point number c nagpur igst if in this case our customer pqr international limited if they were registered in mumbai then our answer would have been mumbai supplies made under the cgst act 2017 to scz be treated as dash and the supplies which are taxable but don't attract gst and for which itc cannot be claimed is treated as dash now here let us revise the concept of zero rated exempt and non gst what is zero rated two supplies are zero rated first is supplies to scz 
and the second is exports of goods or services these two are zero rated next is what is non gst let us do first what is non gst non gst is supply of those items which are not within gst at all which are not within gst at all third is exempt which are within gst but either they have been exempted or the rate of tax has been mentioned as zero for these particular items all right so here they have given us first supply is supply to scz which is zero rated now what is the difference between all of these three items the net effect is same correct net effect is we are not charging gst from our customer that is the net effect so then what is the difference between these terms zero rated has the benefit of input tax credit even if we are not charging gst from our customers that is called zero rated this benefit is given only if we are either exporting outside the country or if we are supplying to special economic zones only then this benefit of getting input tax even if there is no output tax that is provided what is the difference between exempt and non gst non gst is totally outside gst the levy itself is not there the levy of gst itself is not there on these particular items that's why it is called non gst whereas exempt is tax it is within gst but because of the exemption it is outside it is within the power of the gst law to tax these items but because they have given an exemption it is uh, not attracting tax that's why the answer here is zero rated and exempt next one surya enterprises received advance amount of 2 lakh rupees on 12th september from ravi okay ravi kant against which invoice for value of goods of 1 lakh 90 thousand was issued on 16 september okay four days later hmm four days later they issued the invoice but what is important to note here it is for goods the invoice is raised for goods balance amount of 10000 which he has received extra 2 lakhs he received 1 lakh 90000 he has billed balance amount of 10000 on the request of ravi kant was to be adjusted in the next bill which was issued by surya enterprises on 3/10/3rd october 2020 the time of supply for the amount of 10000 is what so this is i would say a very tricky question uh let us try to solve this the first thing that we have to notice it is supply of goods when there is supply of goods do we pay tax on advance received answer is no we do not pay any tax for advance received in case of goods in case of goods we pay the tax when we raise the invoice so whenever tax invoice has been raised that is uh, the important date for us to check and we are not bothered about when was the money received so for this 10000 rupees we have to check when was the invoice raised for this 10000 rupees when was the invoice raised for 1 lakh 90000 invoice was raised on 16 september for this 10000 rupees the invoice is raised on 3rd of october so our answer will be 3rd of october 2020 that is option number c next one ajay chandra an agriculturist supplies raw cotton to bilwara textiles okay he is an agriculturist supplying raw cotton now this particular transaction is covered under reverse charge this particular transaction it is covered under reverse charge it is notified under the list for reverse charge of goods manufacturers of cotton shirts details of events with date taken place in this transaction are placement of order 24 bilwara textile received goods 12 5 invoice issued 
15 5 payment received now payment received again they have divided into two payment by check recorded in the books on this date and actually got credited in the bank on 24 may now we have to find out the time of supply so two things first uh, we have to check let me show you the list of those supplies of goods which attract reverse charge this is the list this is also there as part of our slides but we had not done in detail because it is not part of your uh, syllabus i couldn't find it in your textbook but still this list was shared with you so if you see in this list there are some items which if supplied by agriculturist to any registered person it suffers uh, gst under reverse charge so raw cotton supplied by agriculturist to any registered person is falling forming part of this list so there is reverse charge on this this is the first thing that we were supposed to know the second thing that we are supposed to know is if it is reverse charge if it is reverse charge for supply of goods then what is the time of supply we have to check three dates we have to check three dates date of receipt of goods date of us making the payment and date immediately following 30 days from the date of invoice out of these three whichever is the earliest that would be the date of uh, time of supply and for date of payment if we have two dates then book of entry date or bank debit date whichever is earlier that date we will take into consideration so they have given us totally four dates actually they've given i think five dates four are relevant for us all right now let's go back to that list first let's check on which date the goods were received goods were received on 12 may 2021 okay now let's check what is the date of payment to check the date of payment we have two dates date on which we recorded in books and date on which it actually went from our bank so out of these two whichever is earlier that we will take as date of payment so 12 may and 20, uh, 20 may and 24 may so 20 may is earlier 20 may we will consider as date of payment now we will compare this with the date of receipt of goods goods were received on 12 may and payment done on 20th may what is early 12 may is early so payment date let us ignore the third date that we are supposed to consider is 30 days from the date of issue of invoice when was the invoice issued invoice is issued on 15 may so 30 days from 15 may will be 15 june so between 15 june and 12 may what is earlier 12 may is earlier so after comparing all the three dates we find that 12 may is the earliest of the three that's why 12 may will be our answer 12 may is our answer okay madhusudan of kota an unregistered person engages wedding event company registered at delhi for destination marriage of her daughter radhika to be solemnized in november at royal palace of jamnagar gujarat state and find out the place of supply as per provisions of igst so the previous question that we did on place of supply that was also special because it had training this is also special because it has event management Training and event both are special because both of them, if they are provided to an unregistered person, then the place where training is happening, place where event is happening, that will be the place of supply. But if they are provided to a registered person, then wherever this registered person is registered, that would be the place of supply. So in this case, since we are talking about marriage and all that, we can safely assume that uh, our in fact, it is given specifically, no need to assume, sorry. Madhusudan of Kota is an unregistered person. Our customer is not registered. So whenever our customer is not registered, the place of supply is wherever the event is taking place. So here, where is the event taking place? Registered at Delhi. Okay, service provider is registered at Delhi. Destination wedding is happening at Gujarat. 
So Jamnagar Gujarat will become our place of supply. So let's go to the list. Let's go to the list of these entries. So this was the list. Section number 12, place of supply for services. What are these type of special category? Point number 7, 9, 10, and 11. Wherever this star mark has been put. Training and performance appraisal. Organization of event. Transportation of goods. Transportation of passenger. These four are those services which if provided to a registered person, we will ignore everything and the location where the person is registered, customer is registered, that would become relevant. Okay. Ashok supplies goods to Bhanu who further supplies such goods to Chetan on behalf of Ashok. Okay, that means we are talking about an agent. The consideration for such supply was guaranteed by Bhanu. Bhanu is telling, see Ashok does not know who is the customer. Ashok just knows I have a product, I want to sell it. Bhanu is telling, I will find you a buyer. Ashok is saying, what is the guarantee that that buyer will pay me? What if that buyer runs away with my goods? Bhanu is saying, I am giving you the guarantee. If the person with whom I tell you to do business, that person does not pay you, I will pay you on that person's behalf. What are such persons called? Such persons are called Del Crede agent. They are called Den Del Crede agent. So this is not part of your uh, textbook either. I don't think it is part of the ICSI material also, but this is coming from general knowledge that such agents who give such guarantees, they are called Dell Credit agents. That's why point number D is the right answer. Okay. Rajasthan government runs a lottery, Dhan Varsha, lottery draw, Dhan Varsha, of which to be made on Diwali 2021. Runs a lottery, then we should draw of which to be made. Okay, little grammatical error. The tickets having face value of rupees 100 each were supplied to agents for 95 each, whereas the price to be price is notified in the official gazette of Rajasthan government is 92 each. State the value as per rule 31A. So, what is the value as per rule 31A? Rule 31A says take the face value of the ticket or take the price notified by the government out of these two, whichever is higher, not lower, whichever is higher, take that value, multiply by 100, divide by 128. Take that value, multiply by 100, divide by 128. So let us do that. Uh, what is the face value? Face value is 100. What is the price notified by the government? The price notified by the government is 92. Out of these two, which is higher? 100 is higher. So 100 into 100 divided by 128 is what we're supposed to do. So let's do that. Let me open the calculator. 100 into 100 divided by 128. 78.125 is the right answer, which is not an option itself. So what to do? Select anything you should get the marks. Ideally, you should get the marks. Let us go back and see that particular slide also where this value, valuation rule is mentioned. This is that uh, slide value of supply for lottery, 100 by 128 of face value of ticket or 100 by 128 of price notified by organizing state, whichever is higher. Okay. Next one. Goods or services or both together are often supplied in combination. Yes, that's true. And that's when it may not be simple enough to distinguish supplies and identify separately as each of them may attract a different rate of tax, but is being sold as one package. Okay. In this context, examine the following statements and identify which are not correct example of supply as defined under 230 or 274. Now, 
just by reading so much, it must be clear that they're talking about either composite supply or mixed supply because they're talking about two or more things being supplied together. And we have to identify what is the main item, right? It is not easy. They have told in the sentence that is a hint enough to find out whether it is composite or mixed supply. Then they have given section number references. Now it is possible that you don't remember the section for composite supply and the section for mixed supply. How do we find it out? Well, if you remember that section two, it is a list which is in alphabetical order. It is a list which is in alphabetical order. You will be able to guess that composite supply starts with C will come before mixed supply. So 230 is composite and 274 is mixed. Even if you don't remember these section numbers, all right? With that in mind, now let us see what examples they have given. Atal buys a car and also purchases warranty maintenance for a nominal amount. So car, along with car, what he has taken? Warranty and maintenance services. Car and package of warranty and maintenance is covered under 274, they are saying. That means mixed, they are saying. Is that correct? Answer is no. It is not mixed. Why? Because getting warranty and maintenance along with car, it is ordinary. Car is principal. Car is principal. And it is bundled in the natural course of business. No artificial or forceful bundling is happening here. Correct? So it is not covered under 274. It is covered under 230, which is composite supply. So same example they have given again. The only difference is now they are saying it is 230. So point number two is correct. One is not correct. Next, Rajni buys a microwave oven and some utensils for use in microwave oven. So what has she purchased? She has purchased oven and utensils. Both microwave oven and utensils are sold for a single price. This is important because if it is not sold for a single price, it cannot be called as mixed supply. To be called a mixed supply, it has to be for a single price. And between oven and utensils, we cannot say one of them is the principal supply. Can we say oven is more important than utensils and utensils are supporting the oven? We cannot say anything like that, right? So there are two separate items, naturally not bundled, supplied for a single price. This is an example of mixed supply. So answer should be 274 and not 230, right? Okay, so this is actually correct. It is 274, it is mixed supply, that is correct. Next one, Rajni buys chocolates, juices, Butter from a shop, all of these have different prices. Chocolate juices and butter. Okay. And, sorry, let me read again. Rajni buys chocolate juices and butter from a shop. All the items have different prices. Chocolate juices and butter are supply as per 274. Now, chocolate juices and butter, can we say that they are composite supply. We cannot say they are composite supply because chocolate juice or butter, none of them is supporting each other. But one very crucial information is missing from this particular question. What is that? What is missing? They have nowhere told that they are being sold for a single price. That they have not told. They have nowhere given us the information that chocolate juices and butter are being sold for a single price. That's why it should not get covered under 274 because mixed supply, the primary requirement is it should be sold for a single price. Since it is not sold for a single price, we cannot conclude that this is a mixed supply. So what were they asking in the question? They are asking us, identify which are not correct. Identify what are not correct. So point number one is not correct and point number four is also not correct. So that's why option number A, one and four is the correct answer. Okay. 
Generally, the supplier of goods or services is liable to pay GST. However, in specified case, the liability may be cast upon the recipient under reverse charge. Find and state in which of the following cases GST is payable by the recipient of services under reverse charge. Service provided by way of sponsorship to MNO Limited. Now, again, the list of RCM is not given in your textbook, but still this list was shared by me in my slides, right? Uh, the examiners actually should not ask so many questions outside the syllabus, but this is also outside the syllabus. Services provided by way of sponsorship to MNO Limited. Now, sponsorship services, when they are provided to a body corporate or to a partnership, it attracts reverse charge. So, in this case, MNO Limited gives us the hint that it is a company. Since it is a company, it is a body corporate. So, this particular service is covered under reverse charge. Services given by Y Limited to RAM through its director. Now, in the list of reverse charge, if a director provides services to a company, that is covered under reverse charge. Director providing services to the company is covered under reverse charge. But here what they are saying, services are given by the company to the director or through its director to somebody else. By the company to anybody is not covered under reverse charge. Director to the company is covered under reverse charge. So point number two does not suffer reverse charge. Services provided by Department of Posts by way of speed post to ABC Limited. Now this point is covered under the list where reverse charges, uh, where services are provided by the government to somebody else. In that list, specifically services of speed post has been excluded services of speed post has been excluded. Generally, whatever service the department is providing, government is providing, that is under reverse charge, except then there is a list. In that list, speed post is covered. So that's why point number three also does not suffer reverse charge. Next one, services provided by recovery agent to IGB bank. This is covered under reverse charge. So the answer is point number one and point number four. How would you know this? You would have to go through the entire list, which I think is not right to be done from the ICSI sites, but it has been done or to do. So what I would suggest is to at least go through that list and see the important ones which are already marked in that list. I think it is colored in yellow. So just go through that list and keep the yellow pointers in mind. Next one. In case of Goods Transport Agency services, tax under GST, under CGST Act is to be paid under forward charge basis when? Okay, so this also again part of the RCM list. Goods Transport Agencies, they have two options. The first option is either they can charge GST at 12% from their customer and claim the input tax benefit. That is the first option. Second option is they can forget about input tax credit and don't charge any GST from the customer. Customer will directly pay GST under reverse charge at 5%. Option number one, goods transport agencies charge 12% from the customer. Option number two, goods transport agencies do not charge anything from the customer. Customer directly pays under reverse charge, but the rate is reduced from 12 to five. These are the two options, right? So here they are saying, if it is forward charge basis, then how much is the rate? Answer is 12%. GST is payable at 12%. All of these other options for 5% that is covered if the customer is directly paying to the government. Next one. Find from the following, which invert supplies are not eligible under 17.5? That means we cannot claim the credit. Okay. What is the business engaged in the business of manufacturing paints and chemicals? Right. First one is trucks used in the 
supply of finished goods. So if you remember, any vehicle which is used for the transportation of goods, for that there is no embargo, for that there is no restriction. So trucks is eligible totally. Food and beverages consumed by workers in the factory. Food and beverages, we cannot claim. It is part of the negative list, that is 17.5. Life and health insurance paid for staff as per government policy. So this is important. Life and health, actually it is not allowed. But if it is a requirement of the government, then it is allowed. So life and health insurance, since it is as per government policy, it is allowed. Last one. Motor vehicle of seating capacity of 12, excluding the driver. So this is very tricky. Why is this tricky? Because in the law, it is given that motor vehicle with seating capacity of 13, including driver, is allowed. Motor vehicle with seating capacity of 13, including driver, is allowed. So here, including driver, how many people are there? 13. Because they are saying 12 excluding driver. If we include the driver, it will become 13. Once it is 13, we can claim the credit of this motor vehicle also. So the only item for which credit cannot be claimed is food and beverages. Very, very tricky questions. All right, next. XYZ Limited of Jaipur purchased on 1st August 2019 a machine for 10 lakhs, paid IGST at 12%, the ITC of capital goods used in business was claimed till machine was sold on 5th of December. So they purchased the machine, they claimed the input tax credit. Now they are selling the machine for 6 lakhs. Okay. Find out the amount of tax payable or ITC reversible. Now, as soon as they talk about machine, it should ring a bell that they are talking about capital goods. If they're talking about capital goods, what the government wants is, once you have purchased the goods, government is giving you the entire credit. It is not saying, use it, get the credit in installments. Government is saying, I will give you the full credit, no problem, the day you purchase, take 100% credit. But it is also expecting that once you purchase the machine, you use it for five years. If you sell the machine before five years, government is saying, for the period that you use the machine, I will let you claim the credit on pro rata basis. And for the period balance in that five years, I will reverse, I will ask you to reverse the credit. Okay. So here they have sold it. Now let us compute what was the GST? What was the GST that they were supposed to reverse because they sold it? Okay. First, let us find out. Let me open an Excel file just to note down my rough work. Okay. They purchased it for 10 lakhs and paid 12% GST. So that is 10 lakhs. 12% GST I paid. So into 12%. This is the GST. I paid or GST claimed originally when I purchased it, I claimed 1,20,000. I had purchased on 1st August 2019 and I sold it on 5th December 2020. So my job now is to compute how many quarters are there between 1st August 2019 to 5th December 2020. Let's do the counting. So from 1st August 2019 to 1st August 2020, there are four quarters. Why? Because that is one year. 1st August 2019 to 1st August 2020, four quarters are done. That is one year. Now we have to count quarters from 1st August 2020 to the date of sale. That is 5th December 2020. Okay. So April, May, June is over. July, August, September, till there we have counted four quarters. So in the second quarter still around one month is left. Our law says whenever there is part of the month, we have to count it as full month. So April, May, June already over part of these four quarters. June, July, August, we have to count it as one more quarter because part of it is left. June, July, August, that makes it 
five quarters from august now september october sorry april may june july august september october november december so october november december is also part of the quarter that also we have to count as full month part of the third quarter is also there so totally six months four months till first august 2020 and two quarters from august 2020 to uh, december 2020 all right so totally six quarters are there now let's see if it is six quarters six quarters then per quarter we are supposed to reverse 5% into 5% per quarter we are supposed to uh, re reverse 5% into 120000 so totally how much are we supposed to reverse 120000 into 5% six times we will sorry we are allowed to claim so much we are allowed to claim 36000 how much we were not supposed to claim or how much we are supposed to reverse 120000 was the total minus 36000 84000 we have to reverse reverse 80 84000 rupees all right but we have to compare this with the tax payable on sale so the sale value is 6 lakh on that also 12% has been charged so 6 lakhs on 6 lakhs 12% this is the tax on sale out of these two out of these two whichever is higher that we are supposed to pay if the tax on sale is higher we are supposed to pay that if the amount of credit reversible is higher then we are supposed to reverse in this case 84000 is higher than 72000 so our answer is 84000 all right okay Chandra Prakash acquired a capital asset on again capital asset on first April two thousand nineteen. Okay, which was used for manufacturing and production of goods, supplies which are exempt under GST. Okay, that means when we purchased it, we were not allowed to claim any credit. However, the government by notification issued in November two thousand twenty. Made the supplies so manufactured as taxable. Cost of capital asset is five lakh, on which GST eighteen percent we have we have already paid. Amount of input tax credit on such capital assets available by reason of asset now becoming taxable is how much? Okay, so the same question: five percent per quarter is the calculation that we take into consideration. Let us see what was the GST that we paid when we purchased it. Five lakh was our value of purchase on that we paid 18% gst 90000 rupees gst we we paid at the time of purchase now we are supposed to see how many quarters was it used when it was exempted okay so we will start from the date of purchase 1st april 2019 till the date it became taxable that means till november 2020 we have to count number of quarters okay so the same method from april 2019 to april 2020 how many quarters are there four quarters from let me write down first april 2019 to november 2020 let us take first november 2020 okay so from first april 2019 To first April or let's say thirty first March two thousand nineteen, how many quarters? Four quarters are there. Four quarters over. So now from first April two thousand twenty, from first April two thousand twenty to first November two thousand twenty, how many quarters are there that we are supposed to count? So April, May, June. That is the first quarter. April, May, June, one quarter. July, August, September, another quarter. October, November. December is the third quarter, but entire quarter we did not use it. We used it only for part of the quarter. But the law says part of the quarter to be treated as one full quarter. So how many quarters are there? Totally seven quarters are there when we used it while the final item was exempt. 
So for seven quarters, you're supposed to reverse the credit. So 90,000 into 5% for seven quarters. This much we will, we are not supposed to claim. So this much don't claim. How much can we claim? We can claim 90,000 minus 91,500. This we can claim. So 58,500 is our answer. Our answer is 58,500. Okay. Aryan Limited has its head office at Mumbai. Branches located at different places in different states across India. The head office collects the ITC on all purchases made and distributes the ITC amongst the branches as CGST, SGST, UTGST, IGST. Find out the type of entity which is being exhibited by Aryan Limited. So the answer is obviously input service distributor. Let us revise once what is the concept of input service distributor. So ISD or input service distributor that is defined under 261, it says ISD means an office of the supplier which receives tax invoice for input services, only services, not for goods, only services, and issues a document to distribute this credit. So first they receive the credit, then they distribute the credit to another branch of such supplier. That is, another branch means obviously it will have the same pan only. In the law it says, having the same pan, I have written another branch because it makes it more readable. Now, what is the concept of input service distributor? Let me explain with the help of an example. What happens is when there are some companies which have multiple presence within India, let's say they are present, their head office is present in Karnataka and they have branch office in Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Assam, all of these places, they have branch offices. Sometimes what will happen is the head office will receive some purchase invoice. The head office will receive some purchase invoice for a service. The benefit of this invoice, the benefit of this service would have gone to the branches of the company. The benefit of that service would have gone to the branches of the company. To give an example, let's say it is a audit related invoice. Let's say it is an audit related invoice. The audit was to be done of Delhi branch, Mumbai branch, Kolkata branch, Assam branch. Audit was done at those branches. But the bill for the audit has been given by the auditor directly to the Bangalore head office. Can the Bangalore head office claim this credit? Bangalore head office cannot claim this credit. Why? Because it has not received the services. If you remember in section 16, there are four conditions, now five, four conditions to be able to claim the credit. One of those conditions is the goods or services should have been received. The benefit of this audit service has not, by, not been received by the Karnataka branch. So what should the Karnataka branch do? Karnataka branch can take the credit of the audit service and then distribute the credit between its different branches. How will it distribute? It will check for this particular service, which branch has got the benefit, which branch has used this service. It will allocate that much amount of uh, credit to that particular branch. If there are multiple branches, like in our example, there are multiple branches, then how to distribute? Then the law says, take the ratio of turnover. Take the ratio of turnover of these branches and on that basis, distribute the credit. So such, uh, uh, such an office which distributes the credit, whose job is take the input services and then distribute the credit, that office is known as input service distributor or ISD in short. So our answer was ISD. Okay. Next one. Section 10, which is composition. 
contains the provisions regards composition levy with the objective of bringing simplicity and reduce compliance cost for small taxpayers state which out of the following statements is not correct for a taxpayer who has opted for composition we have to select which is not correct a registered person supplying goods under composition scheme has shall issue bill of supply and cannot raise tax invoice this is absolutely correct last date for payment of liability towards tax interest penalty and all that is 18th of the next month that is also correct last date for payment of liability towards is 20th of next month this is not correct because already we have told point number b is correct so point number c obviously not correct a composition dealer shall mention the words composition taxable person not eligible to collect tax on supplies this is also correct so our answer was point number c taxpayers who are required to pay tax for the supply of goods or services or both on the basis of rcm under gst have to get registered have to get themselves registered when they cross the threshold limit of turnover of there is no threshold limit if i am liable to pay gst under reverse charge i have to take compulsory registration without considering any threshold limit so the answer is none of the above because there is no threshold limit for such a person furnishing of details of outward supplies and of inward supplies as per section section 37 and 38 are not applicable to a person paying tax under composition scheme however a person who has opted for composition scheme is still required to file a return what is that form number so this is gstr 4 electronic liability register specified under 497 shall be maintained as per rule 85 in form number dash for each person liable to pay tax interest penalty so the answer is pmt1 and it is on common portal so this is to be memorized actually nothing to be explained here the liability register has got a form number and the form number is pmt01 next one vikas limited provides following information and details for the month of november intra state outward supply 9 lakh inter state exempt outward supply 6 lakh turnover of exported goods 12 lakh payment made for availing gta services 1 lakh the aggregate turnover is how much so in aggregate turnover we add all the types of outward supplies we don't add any type of inward supply even if we are paying under reverse charge if it is a inward supply we don't add if it is a outward supply we add all types of outward supplies be it within the state interstate or inter country does not matter we add everything so out of this intra state supply 9 lakh we will add interstate exempt does not matter exam taxable nothing matters if it is outward add it 6 lakh we will add turn turnover of exported goods also we will add payment made for availing gts services this is inward supply we are making the payment of gst for buying from gts service this we will not add so we will add a b and c 9 plus 6 is 15 15 plus 12 is um 27 so answer is 27 okay any tax paid by the taxpayer will be reflected in electronic cash ledger true to initiate a payment taxpayer shall generate a chalan using form number what and it is valid for how many days this again it is a totally memory based question answer is pmt6 for 15 days jc and co chartered accountants operating at mumbai provided services to client and issued bill as under professional fees 1 lakh out of pocket expense 10000 mca fees 5000 this i think we solved in the class also we to find out the value of services we take only professional fee and out of pocket expense into consideration 
we don't add MCA fee. Why we don't add MCA fee? Because MCA fee that we are going to charge from our clients, it is in the form of pure agent. We incurred this expense on behalf of our client. Actually, they were supposed to incur it, incur it but we incurred it on their behalf. We will charge only so much from our customers in, in the name of MCA fee. We spend 5,000, we'll collect 5,000. Who gets the benefit of it? The customer directly gets the benefit of it. This benefit never comes to the professional. So it meets all the conditions for being a recovery as a pure agent. So this 5,000 should not be included. Out of pocket expenses and one lakh rupees has to be included. Answer is one lakh 10,000. Services provided by way of warehousing of certain specified goods are exempt under CGST Act. Find out from the following, which in this context are exempt. This again is coming from the exemption notification 12 by 2017, actually not covered in your syllabus. So out of this, what it says is any of the items which are related either to cultivation or which are related to such process after cultivation that does not significantly change the nature of the item, which makes it only fit for to be taken to the primary market and does not convert it into the finished product. Only such items are covered under the exemption when it comes to agriculture. So processed tea, jaggery, processed coffee, unbranded basin, out of all of these, unbranded basin is exempt. Okay. Okay. Compute the value of taxable service in the context of provisions of CGST Act and the rules framed there under from the following transactions made available by Anand Agro Limited engaged in agriculture related services for the month of September. Again, agriculture related is forming part of the exemption notification. So if I'm not wrong, some five questions have been asked which are not covered in your portion. Renting of agro machinery, it is part of exemption. So this five flag is not taxable. Cultivation of ornamental flowers, since it is cultivation, cultivation is also part of the exemption notification, 2.5, not taxable. Processing of tomato ketchup. This is a process which is not related to agriculture because you are converting the raw material into finished product, right? So this will suffer tax, 3 lakhs will suffer tax. Plantation of rubber, <coughs> cultivation related, this will not suffer tax. Processing of potato chips, this will suffer tax. So 3 will suffer tax, 1.5 will suffer tax, total of it is 4.5. That is not exempt. Ascertain and find out as per provisions of CGST Act and notification is issued there under, which of the following is a correct statement? So we have to find out what is correct. Services provided by government ITIs to individual trainees are exempt from GST. Again, this is a exemption notification related question. Services provided by government ITIs to individual trainees are exempt. This is true, it is exempt. Services provided by state government and private sector service providers by way of transportation of patients in ambulance. This is also exempt. Transportation of patients in ambulance is exempt. Services of renting shops in hospitals. This is not exempt. Renting of shops, even if it is in hospital, it is not exempt. It is not part of healthcare services. Services provided by police to PSUs are taxable. This is also exempt. Now, this is also correct. This is also taxable. All right. So, only point number three is not correct. It is not exempt. It should be taxable. This 
is correct it is taxable this is correct it is exempt this is also correct it is exempt so 1 2 and 4 are correct very tricky again because they were mentioning exempt 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 and suddenly they mentioned taxable right so you have to be very very careful As per section 16 of CGST Act relating to eligibility and conditions for taking ITC, state when input tax credit shall be, state when the ITC be available where the goods are received in lots and installments. So whenever goods are received in lots or in installments, we are allowed to take the credit only when we have received the last lot or installment, right? So 50% and all that, not correct. ITC can be availed upon receipt of the last installment of goods that is correct. All the other options are not correct. Taxes paid under GST by a registered person are covered both as input tax and output tax. State as per the provisions of CGST Act, which out of the following are covered in the definition of input tax. So what are the sources of input tax? That is what they are asking us. So tax paid under RCM, that is a source. Tax paid at the time of import, IGST, that is also a source. Taxes under composition, we are not allowed to claim. Actually, there, there are no taxes under composition because we are not allowed to charge anything from the customers as well. <clears throat> so point number three is not true. CGST on interest state services, that is also no problem. So only point number three is not allowed. Apart from that, everything else is allowed. So the answer is C, one, two, and four. Kuber, a registered person under GST as proprietor of MS Natraj restaurant died on 15 July 2020 and left behind his wife and son. His son wants to continue the business of the diseased father and therefore consulted the tax consultant to complete the formalities under GST. The consultant had given which out of the following advices to the son for carrying the business of Natraj restaurant after the death of his father. So the law relating to this is once a person dies, and the business of that person is taken over by his son or daughter or somebody else. This is called as a transfer of business. Transfer of business is covered under the special provisions given under section number 18, which we have done in the ITC chapter. In the ITC chapter, we have done 18.3, if I'm not wrong. Uh, in what situations the input tax credit of the previous business can be transferred to the new business. So their amalgamation, demerger, sale, transfer of business, all of these were covered. Death is one of the reasons for transfer of business. So whenever a person dies, what the procedure is, the son or the legal heir, that person will first place a request for transfer of the credit from father's GST number to his GST number. Sorry, first he will take a registration, First, he will take a registration. Son will take registration in his own name because span is changing. Father's span is different. Son's span is different. He will have to take registration in his own name. Son will have to take registration. That is the first step. Next, he will apply for transfer of credit. He will say, whatever credit was there in the father's business should be transferred to me because I am taking over. Third, he will apply for cancellation of the GST number of father. So three things. First, he will take new registration. Next, he will get the input tax transferred. Third, he will cancel the GST number of his father. These three steps are there. So out of all of these options, the first option is correct, where it says the son shall first take registration. Then he will file form ITC 02 to get it transferred. Third step is also there. Third step is there that then he will apply for cancellation of father's GST number. These three steps are there. So point number A is correct. Next, electronic credit ledger shall be maintained in PMT02 by each registered person. State which out of the following shall be debited to electronic credit ledger. So an electronic credit ledger, 
what is the debit debit is any type of input tax credit right so here it says matched input tax credit provisional input tax credit unmatched input tax credit does not matter what type of input tax credit it is all types of input tax credit can be debited there is no restriction saying that you will be able to debit only this particular item right okay a person other than casual or non taxable shall should apply to for registration as per the provisions section 25 within how many days the answer is 30 days why they are saying other than casual non taxable sorry non resident taxable person because for them there are different provisions so they are asking generally a regular person should apply for registration within how many days they should apply within 30 days a registered person as per section 35 is required to maintain necessary accounts and other records at the dash and all such records could be in electronic or manual form right so the answer is principal place of business this is specifically given in the law itself accountant's address and all of that is not correct most of the questions i would say are memory based hardly some two or three questions were uh where we had to compute something they were practical few questions were logical but mostly the questions are memory based if you see chapters like payment of tax and returns they have so many form numbers due dates and all that so they have asked they have tried to divide their questions in such a way that no chapter is left behind they have to ask something from the payment chapter what to ask it contains only those questions so they have picked up uh more of memory based questions in this particular attempt i would say this is a fairly tough paper as per rule 138 of the cgst rules stipulates that eva bill under gst laws required to be generated when the registered person causes movement of goods of consignment in total of the value for more than rupees 50000 whether in relation to supply for reasons other than supply due to inward supplies from unregistered person all of this is given in the eva bill uh, rules itself eva bill section that it does not matter if it is for supply even if it is for reasons other than supply say for example i am transporting goods from my branch to another branch within the same state in that case also it's required let's say it is for job work that is also not supply even then it is required and if we are buying from a unregistered person the unregistered person he will not be registered he will not be able to generate eva bill so the buyer has to generate eva bill all of these cases are covered the self assessed input tax credit in the return filed in form 3b of the registered person shall be credited to his dash in accordance with 41 so whatever credit is there that gets accumulated not in cash liability or blank ledger it gets credited in electronic credit ledger itself so this was a fairly easy question customs so five questions from customs 95 uh, 45 questions from gst 96 the rates of customs duty alongside classification are being given in the customs tariff act this everybody knows if it is customs act we have the main law where are the rates given the rates are given in customs tariff act value of insurance when not ascertainable while making valuation of imported goods for the purpose of charge of customs duty is 1.125% of fob so that is the right answer find from the following list which are to be treated as port sea port indian railway depot indian container depot airport container freight stations not attached to the port so indian railway depot is actually not correct because there is nothing called indian 
railway depot there is seaport there is india uh, inland container depot airport is also there point number 2 indian inland railway depot does not exist only this is made up and point number 5 which says container freight station not attached to port that is also not correct because the purpose of container freight station itself is to support a port so whatever few of the uh, tasks which the port authorities did not want to be uh, too much of a burden on the port they outsource such tasks to the container freight stations they are always attached to a port so if it is not attached to a port it is not covered by the customs law so point number 2 does not exist and point number 5 because it is not part of the port it is not covered so 2 and 5 are not covered 1 3 and 4 they are covered within the meaning of port the importer of goods as per section dash of the customs act needs to file needs to submit duly signed bill of entry answer is section number 46 which contains the procedure for imports so section 46 is the right answer application for refund of import duty paid under the customs act where the goods are found to be defective or not in conformity with the specification importer does not claim any duty drawback and relinquishes his title to the goods should be filed within oops should be filed within Six months from the relevant date. Again, a totally memory-based question. You have to simply remember it and answer it. So that was all. That was the entire fifty questions of December two thousand twenty-one exam. I hope uh, you would have got some idea of how to approach the questions. How important it is to read the entire question. few things that i find uh, you should keep in mind first is check always what are they asking for are they asking for what is correct or what is wrong we can go wrong there second don't assume anything point number a b and c if they were related to exempt does not mean point number d also is related to exempt which you saw in one question how smartly they put a b and c related to exempt point number d related to taxable right so read the entire a uh, question word by word because they try to play around with that and see how well you are focused on reading the question third there are some memory based questions so memorize the form numbers memorize the dates which are given in your textbook um, i think that's all that, that would set you up logic based questions and theory based questions which you already understand you will be able to answer anyways that's it so with that wish you very all the very best if you have some doubts please reach out to me looking forward to your exams all the best once again